Rafe and I are both media people and we're both lifelong British Columbians and we, we both recognize that the lack of coverage of these issues by the mainstream media is, is something that's really allowed this, these, these problems to develop. And so that's, that's the, the way that we choose to tackle these challenges is to inform and empower British Columbians with good information. And uh, we're using the internet, uh, uh, I think, to great effect, but we really love doing um, live shows like this because it's a completely different experience. It gives a chance for, for people to meet their neighbors and get connected around these issues. We're just doing a few warm-ups uh, events here before uh, holiday season, but come February, we're gonna probably hit another 30 communities or so around the province. And this is really something that we really uh, realized the, the power of when we, we did the same thing around the river issue over the last couple of years, including coming to some of these communities on the North Island a number of times. So uh, we're very excited to get back on the road and uh, it's great to be here tonight and it's uh, really inspiring for us to kind of kick off our tour with, with some great events like these. What we need to do is bring the power back to us. I mean, I have argued why we need wild salmon. They feed 127 species. They're the power cord. If you're, in, if you're in Vancouver, every time it's blowing southeast, you're breathing oxygen made by trees, fed by salmon. I could tell you all of those things. But it really comes down to, if we really want it, why do we have to argue with our own government that we, we get to keep it? Who are they to say we can't have this, that, and the next thing? And what they propose on doing is having a 3,100 hectare underground footprint underground and uh, mine this coal with a 200 hectare above ground footprint. They're going to bring the coal to the surface. They're going to wash it and, and process it. And they're going to load it on. They're going to load it onto uh, double uh, trailer B trains. They're going to transport it 80 kilometers over to Port Alberni, where they propose to put a coal port over Port Alberni and then have Panamex uh, cargo ships come into the port, load the, uh, the product on there, the coal product on there, and ship it to the Pacific Rim countries, mainly probably Japan, uh, China, and Korea. From my perspective, I live in Fannie Bay. I draw my water out of a, a, my own private well, a shallow well. So I was concerned about water, not only quality, but quantity. I was worried about the shellfish industry. This thing is going to be, I don't, I don't think there's ever been a coal mine that's ever been proposed. It's going to, going to be six kilometers from Bain Sound, one, a world-renowned shellfish industry, and very important to our local economy. So there's like five to 600 people to make their living day in and day out there, busting their butts down there on the beach to put on the table what you guys uh, you know, are able to enjoy. Every year, BC Hydro pays a nice big fat dividend to the province of British Columbia. Hundreds of millions of dollars. One year, nearly a billion. And that goes to our schools and our hospitals, our social programs, our highways and so on. Now I just told you, Hydro's $50 billion in the goo so far and losing money. How can they pay a dividend under those circumstances? Never fear, you will get your dividend because they're gonna raise your rate so they can pay it back to you as part of a dividend. Uh, one of the people I paddled down the river with was Chief Marilyn Baptiste, who said in the Globe and Mail about a month and a half ago, she would die before they turn Fish Lake into a mining tailing pond. And that is the difference of what's happening right now. We used to donate 10 bucks to an environmental group, and they did their best, but they've been co-opted largely by the corporate funds that are funding them by trying to get into deals with the companies. And now what I see is people defending their home. And that's what I am, I'm a, I'm a woman cleaning house. I want my children to be able to have what I have had. And so it's a whole different thing. And yeah, my hat's off to you and, and all of you that are just saying, this is not gonna happen because we're gonna stand up. We produce currently less than half of our total food in British Columbia. We've gone from making 86% of our own vegetables in 1970 to 43% today or in 2007, and that's trending downward. And so the last thing we should be doing is developing any agricultural land. And we've looked at some really positive examples in the lower mainland, in Tawasin and Richmond, community gardening programs that not only 
are doing wonders to produce food for these local communities and farmers markets on the weekends, but also to connect families and within the community. It's a great activity to bring people together. And so there's a lot, I really want to focus on those positive examples. There's definitely a lot of things we can do. And in the Second World War, we had victory gardens in Canada a long time before my time, but they still have the old posters like the Rosie the Riveter type posters, build your own, build your victory garden. And so I think we need to t adopt that kind of mentality today, like we are in a crisis state uh, for our food security and we need to be proactive about that. And that's something we're going to be definitely focusing a lot more on. And so that's why I've shown up here for Damien and for Rafe, because it's a, it's, our fish are dying of politics, we're dying of politics. We need to unite, we need to elect governments that serve us. There's many good politicians within the system, one of them's in this room, but alone they can't turn this tide. They really need us. I have been told again and again that when these politicians go up to bat for us, we often are not there. And so that has to end. I mean, life's tough. We can't do it asleep. And you are a bunch of awake people, and the story I heard just before me was so inspiring. It's all a matter of just showing up. So. We know what to do, and I feel, you know, coming off of that paddle for 10 days, I saw the best of people. Just average people, they would call themselves. But when you get involved in something like this, you really shine. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. Everybody says, aren't you exhausted? I'm like, no, I feel energized. These contracts, these IPP contracts are private. Now we know that the Liberals will not open those up. We also know that the leader of the opposition says, I believe in the sanctity of contracts. And I say this to Miss James here, anywhere I go. If you were running as a mayor of a town to clean up a bad city administration and you won, what would you do with the former mayor's brother-in-law that had 25-year contracts at five times what they were worth? Would you say, oh dear, 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 I'm afraid I believe in, in the sanctity of contracts? Or would you say, I believe in the sanctity of conscionable contracts? I don't believe in the sanction of dishonorable, unconscionable ones. And when we open up these contracts, I can tell you we'll find out that they are unconscionable. And if it's Ms. James who's the Premier, I expect her to show us these contracts, and if they're unconscionable, as I'm sure they are, cancel them, just like that. We've got to make it clear that as voters, we expect whomever is elected to honor our farmland, to get rid of fish farms, to restore the protection of our salmon, which is our signature, and say to them, unless you pledge to reverse this government's energy policy, you'll not get our support. 